to get started, I will first introduce myself. My name is Andy Beal. I'm chief scientist of WorldViz. At WorldViz, it's our mission to produce immersive technology that enhances the way people create, learn, and collaborate. And today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Persky. She's an associate investigator at, and the head of the Immersive Virtual Environment Testing Unit, where she directs the Immersive Virtual Environment Testing Area within the Social Behavioral Research Branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. Uh, Let me just say I'm absolutely thrilled to have Susan here um, personally. Uh, she and I uh, have known each other for several decades. We actually had the pleasure of overlapping as colleagues at the University of California, Santa Barbara um, for, uh, uh, I think, about four or five years, um, at, uh, 2000 to say 2004, 2005. And we were both at the Research Center for Virtual Environments and Behavior that was really one of the um, forefronts of developing VR technology for all, all sorts of areas of uh, psychological pursuit. And in particular, Susan uh, helped uh, several social psychologists really kind of do groundbreaking um, uh, development and uh, research in areas of some of which she's going to get to speak to us today about. So, and also, um, uh, let me just also mention uh, we have Dan Tinkham, uh, head of our uh, sales Americas online. I don't know if he's going to pop in via video, but he'll be taking note of all questions and we do invite questions because our format generally is that um, we we hear a presentation and then we invite our audience members to to write down questions there he is there's dan and he will he will uh collect those questions and then present them to us uh, uh visually at the end and we'll go through the ones that uh, we have time to to uh hear what susan has to say so without further ado welcome susan and excited to hear your presentation Thank you. Good stalling, Andy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want to confirm that I'm sharing the correct screen. Are you seeing a full uh, full screen view of my slides? I see a full slide, your first slide, and see the video. And I think we're all set. Great. Okay, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, it is, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, sort of a homecoming. Although I'm sort of coming to you remote via Santa Barbara, I suppose. Um, but I am really excited to be here to help everyone, I think, take a peek into some of the things we can learn uh, from the behavioral data that virtual reality environments produce. Um, and I'm also hoping to take a little time to help us start to think about how we can bolster this kind of research with some of the new data sources that are starting to come online um, right now, pretty much as we speak. Okay. So before we get going, I would like for us to start with a shared definition of behavioral data. Um, so first and foremost, you know, these are really the data that we essentially need um, in order to use a modern VR system. So I'm going to use the example here of a six DOF system uh, where we have position and rotation data. Uh, we can add a couple of hand trackers into that equation. And then we can also start to think about uh, some of the additional data streams that are technically possible and that are actually just starting to become more routinely integrated into VR hardware. Um, although I'll note that most of these haven't really filtered into the relevant academic literature um, yet. So this is gonna be things like additional body trackers, eye tracking, um, physiology, so things like um, EKG, skin temperature, skin conductance, uh, we could also think about brain activity, so things like EEG, um, FNIRs, brain control interfaces, and then things like voice prints, so the characteristics of our voice. Okay, so we have all these potential data streams. We can consider the data over time. So although I never sample them at this rate, they could be sampled at up to 90 times a second. Um, and actually a calculation uh, by Jeremy Balenson and colleagues has suggested that, you know, with just your sort of basic system, um, over a 20 minute VR experience, we could be looking at upwards of 2 million data points. Now, given the other emerging data streams I've talked about, this could sort of be the tip of the iceberg. Although all of that is possible and there are tons of data coming into and through the system, in this domain, when we talk about actually looking at behavioral data, 
there are two super common ways that we tend to look at this behavioral tracing. So the first is looking at location data. Um, this would indicate proxemics or the interpersonal distance that we're keeping. So it's this sort of space bubble but that we leave between ourselves and an interaction partner. In this case, this would be you know, a virtual interaction partner. And the second is gaze direction. So what is in your field of view at any given time um, when you're in VR? Uh, this can be used as a proxy for eye tracking, uh, which up until now hasn't really been a standard thing uh, to include in VR. So these are really simple approaches, obviously, um, though they do make up the vast majority of what is currently in the literature and what's sort of being done and what has been thus validated. So some research teams have approached proxemics measures with a little bit more complexity um, in terms of the assessments. So I'm just showing you one example here um, by Cade McCall and colleagues where uh, he published a paper on proxemic imaging. So this is a simultaneous assessment of both interpersonal distance and gaze direction of two interactants within VR and how they sort of map onto um, one another. Uh, so this is just to show that there are more holistic analytic approaches that are out there and available, um, but being able to apply these approaches is not at all universal. And that's really because um, this, of this idea that sort of context is king. So if you take nothing else away from today, I think the most important thing to remember is that for every measure, everything comes down to context context and to content. So consider the gaze centeredness measure that we just talked about. Um, the psychological or the practical meaning of what a view centeredness measure tells you depends completely on what it is that I might be looking at in the VR environment. So if I'm using a view centeredness measure to assess behavior in interpersonal interaction uh, versus a virtual food choice assessment uh, versus, versus a virtual classroom, um, these measures have absolutely have to be interpreted as a function of the VR context. So as far as I can tell, I just I don't think there's any such thing as validating a behavioral metric um, of a psychological state across all VR settings or all VR environments. It just it's going to have to be context specific. So we can start here by looking at the existing scientific literature that starts to demonstrate the power of VR beh behavioral movement tracing um, to begin to help us to infer psychological states and sometimes even predict behavior. So it's this literature that really forms, you know, sort of the bedrock of the newer approaches that we'll be looking at going forward. So use of VR for behavioral tracing in social and behavioral research has been applied in several domains. Uh, broadly, these group into a few areas. The first one I'm gonna talk about is social approach and avoidance. So this is an area that's been particularly well validated in previous research. Uh, which means that the social approach and avoidance behaviors that we see in VR are enacted similarly in VR as they tend to be in the real world, um, and they tend to follow the patterns that we would expect to see. Um, and a lot of this work actually has been done in clinical populations, which has helped us um, to get some of this converging evidence. So just as an example, um, here's a study that was done in the, the context of autism spectrum disorder um, in 2013 by a group from UC Davis, and they found that children with autism spectrum disorder looked less frequently towards virtual classmates compared to typically developing children. So there are several studies like this one that present convergent evidence, and that strongly suggests that these indexes of uh, physical behavior are viable proxies for social approach and avoidance. As such, uh, VR movement has also been used as ways to detect uh, psychological experiences in sort of, we could say, subclinical areas of social anxiety um, or desire to avoid social partners. So the example I'm giving you here is Juan and her colleagues who tracked uh, the head rotations of students in a virtual classroom. And they quantified this in terms of uh, rotation um, or sort of scanning of the room. Now, what they found was greater scanning behavior was associated with greater anxiety about virtual social partners in the room. So there is a really important special case of social approach and avoidance, um, which is interpersonal bias and discrimination. So this means uh, prejudice against or differential treatment of members of a particular social group. So as you can imagine, uh, this is not something that people tend to like to report about to researchers. Sometimes people aren't even aware um, of their own biases and can't report on them. So this is a psychological process that can be particularly useful to be able to pick up on through behavior. <laughs> 
So what, did, what I'll do here is to start with an example of what this looks like in research using work from my lab. And here we've investigated factors that affect interactions between patients and healthcare providers in clinical settings. I'll mention though that these concepts are applicable to many other domains as well. So the reason that we tend to look at behavior here in these virtual clinical environments is because we know that there are differences in how patients are treated in real world clinics based on their characteristics. So things like race, gender, weight. And we can use the behavior that we see in these clinical simulations as a window into the attitudes and the beliefs and the behaviors and the emotions that can be in play during a medical visit. Um, and we can do this, of course, from the relative safety of a simulated visit as opposed to a real one. So one aim of this project was to explore basic differences in medical student stigmatization of a patient and their clinical decision making based on that patient's apparent weight. So medical students were randomized to interact with one version of a virtual patient. Um, you can see the two versions here on the right side. Um, they were, of course, identical in every way. You know, what she said, her nonverbal behavior, except for the factor we're interested in, which is her, her body size and weight. So as part of this outcome, we looked at medical students' gaze behavior during parts of the visit, and we looked at how much time specifically was spent looking at the patient's face as opposed to other parts of her body or other elements of the environment. So here we used gaze really as a proxy for eye contact, which in addition to everything we already talked about is also really important in medical visits. So looking at this graph, what I show here is that participants made less visual contact with the virtual patient uh, when she was exhibiting obesity as opposed to the lean patient. And then for comparison's sake, we can just look at some patterns we found in our um, reports afterwards of med students responding to questions about the visit and about negative stereotyping of the patient. So as you can see when the patient was lean, um, on the left uh, part of that graph there, medical students negatively stereotyped her less than the version of the patient with obesity. So essentially looking at this gaze behavior gave us information that's consistent with the picture that we're seeing, right? That medical students exhibited more bias against a patient with obesity. So on a more basic level, um, we can look here at another study from a group in Moscow that showed that the minimum distance between a participant and a virtual interaction partner was significantly greater when the virtual human in that interaction appeared to be of an ethnic minority status as opposed to ethnic majority. So this means that by tracking walking behavior, we were able to detect expressed bias against this minority group. This Dutch study that I'm showing you here is one where researchers used an established measure of implicit bias called the IAT. You might be familiar with it. Um, and they showed that that measure was connected with BR walking behavior in the expected way. So those who exhibited more implicit bias on the IAT also maintained more distance from the minority group virtual human. And then finally in this area, my colleagues and I found that when a participant kept more interpersonal distance, uh, from a minority group virtual human during a social interaction, it was actually predictive of more aggressive behavior toward that virtual human in a later encounter. All right, so we can move on now to another set of psychological outcomes. We can call this one sort of effort and performance. This is a really broad category, uh, but it's essentially related to task performance. And so here, these kinds of inferences from the data could be helpful in designing educational VR, health interventions, and so on. So again, I'm going to start with a slightly deeper dive into a study um, out of my lab. And here we used a VR tool that we developed and validated to measure parents' food choices for their child. So why look at VR behavior in this context? Well, obviously, dietary choices are so crucial for health, especially for developing children. Um, and our food choice really isn't, you know, it's not a single choice. Right, it's really a process of little micro behaviors and little micro choices that you know we would really like to be able to dig into to understand how we end up with you know the overall food choices that we make. But our standard measures of food choice and of eating don't really give us access to those little to those little micro processes, um, and so this is another area where uh, we really benefit from using VR. So in the study I'm showing you here, uh, we use the behavioral tracing data of the walking paths to determine how physical movement related to parents' thoughts and feelings about feeding their child. So in this study, we quantified physical walking movement in terms of something called path tortuosity. 
So this is the degree of straightness or curviness of a person's walking path throughout a space. And then the images I'm showing you here, uh, the one at the top is showing you um, a walking path with less tortuosity, and the one on the bottom is very highly tortuous. So what we found was that parents who walked a more tortuous path around the buffet reported feeling less guilty about their child feeding choices in questionnaires afterwards. And so here what we believe is happening is that uh, movement around the environment is associated with perceived effort. So how hard parents feel like they're trying in the VR buffet when they're making a meal for their child. In terms of some other studies in this area, um, we can go from you know, perceived effort to actual performance. Uh, we're looking here again at work by Andrea Stevenson Wan and her colleagues uh, who found that the body language of teachers and students during instruction in VR accurately predicted high or low learning success. Work here by Jabong and colleagues showed that tracking data uh, from head movement, um, as well as eye openness and mouth openness, was related to performance over the course of a task. And these metrics actually were also able to predict errors. And then finally, Holsworth and colleagues found that psychological states, including um, you know, feelings about the VR's us usability, about physical demand, and about presence in the VR environment, could be predicted in part uh, by using physical movement data fed into machine learning models. And then one final category uh, we can look at briefly is this sort of idea of emotion and nonverbal leakage. So here we can think about how behavioral data can give us insight into users' emotional state and other sort of implicit mental processes that individuals may or may not be aware of. And so I'll show you just one study here, and this is data from a study at Stanford that exposed users to a series of uh, 360 videos. And in this study, they showed that the amount of head rotation, so again, sort of a scanning motion around the room, was associated with higher ratings of pleasure during a 360 video experience. So in all, this sort of sampling of existing academic studies shows how harvesting and analyzing VR behavior um, in terms of someone's movement can allow us some access to infer their emotional state, their attitudes, perceived effort, their performance, and so on. And you know, we can start to think about how we might be able to use these data to understand the mind, to build interventions, you know, and to build other really exciting things. We can also start to see how we might be able to use the behavior to predict people's future behavior, um, certainly inside of VR, but maybe outside of VR as well. And then I just want to spend a couple minutes on one other area where we can and certainly have been using VR data quite a lot. Um, this diverges from um, you know, the promised theme of behavior and psychological states a little bit, but I think it's pretty telling. Um, so VR tracking and behavioral data has a lot to tell us actually about the physical and mental functioning of individuals. So we saw earlier, uh, one of the first studies I presented had to do with um, kids with autism spectrum disorder and their behavior in virtual classrooms. And the behavior really diverged between um, the typically developing sample and the sample with ASD. So another example here is research that's associated with my lab at NIH. And here we worked uh, with Skip Rizzo and his colleagues to bring their VR classroom environment into a longitudinal study uh, of kids with ADHD that's happening at the NIH. So the reason we wanted to look at behavioral data here is because we know that kids with ADHD perform worse on attentional tasks. That's really well established, um, but the mechanism for this is not as well established. So here we examined uh, head movements for visual attention behavior, and that helped us to test some theories about the mechanisms that aren't as easy to test in artificial lab settings. So we looked at head movements over time um, in a group of 85 kids with and without ADHD, um, and they, while they were in the virtual classroom doing an attention task. And overall, we found that kids' shifts in their field of view were quantifiably different between kids with and without ADHD. And these shifts partially explain the link between their, their symptoms, you know, as diagnosed by a clinician and the deficits that we see on the attention task. And this can give us a potential target for intervention. Uh, so helping kids to improve their head control or finding ways to redirect their field of view. In the context of schizophrenia, um, this uh, was a Korean study that found that individuals with schizophrenia displayed significantly less eye gaze uh, during a virtual conversation than individuals without schizophrenia. And this was especially true um, when there were negative interpersonal situations. 
And uh, here are some more recent data suggesting that VR can also be used to predict mild cognitive impairment. So this is a study by Howitt and colleagues, and they showed that performance on a walking-based uh, VR navigation task was highly associated with some early markers of cognitive impairment. So I really show this to demonstrate that it isn't just psychological states that can be gleaned from VR behavior. So depending upon the way that a VR context is set up, uh, the samples that are looked at, the measurements that are taken, we can also learn quite a lot about health and physical and mental functioning. Uh, so, so yes. Interrupt your excellent presentation for just one moment. I just want to remind our listeners and those who are new to kind of the way we um, we run these webinars, there is a mechanism on on the GoToMeeting to post questions. Uh, we we have a couple. We'd love to uh, get more of those. Um, that's what we will do when when Susan. Uh, uh, comes to a conclusion, we will uh, we'll entertain all, all the questions that we, we obtain for the audience. Thanks, and back to you. Okay, great. So, um, so before we move beyond sort of this published literature that I've been talking about, um, one of the things I want to do is to look at some of the limitations and some of the gaps in terms of what, um, what has been done sort of so far. So the really big gap, as far as I'm concerned here, is related to validation and replication. Uh, are we really measuring what we think we're measuring? Um, as I showed, there are some areas where we're seeing a lot of good converging evidence, um, but replication as of now is pretty rare. Um, and I think part of this has to do with the context specificity issue that I brought up earlier. You know, we've seen that as VR environments change, the underlying thing that we're measuring with the physical behavior, you know, also changes. However, um, as VR becomes more popular and hopefully more ubiquitous, um, I'm really hopeful that researchers and practitioners will begin to use overlapping VR environments more. You know, this may come through more sharing of environments. Um, it may also come through the development of sort of robust research tools that a lot of people end up using um, because they're you know, user friendly and will work for a lot of labs. So this would give us a lot more opportunity for replication um, and more opportunity to build up the evidence base of validity uh, for certain measures in certain contexts. And then the other gap uh, that I'll talk about briefly just relates to how we're actually performing these analyses. So the metrics that we look at most often, uh, you know, so things like minimum distance represent, you know, really, really dramatic data reduction, right? So when we reduce our really you know, robust fine-grained data down to a single metric or a set of, you know, five metrics, we don't get a good sense necessarily of how the behavior changes over the course of the scenario or what kinds of patterns might emerge out of the data. So the challenge here is to reduce these massive amounts of behavioral data so that they're manageable, but that's so much that we're starting to wash out the meaningful patterns. Uh, we also tend to look at a single metric at a, at a time. So we saw, you know, some interpersonal distance only, some, um, you know, yaw, some head turning only. Um, but we know, you know, clearly that the psychological states and the behaviors that we really care about are complex, right? And they're these interconnected web of factors. So ways to consider maybe more metrics at the same time um, would be helpful. So in thinking about this, there's, of course, many potential solutions to these problems that move us into the realm of big data. Um, so in order to parse out these more nuanced, more meaningful patterns of behavior, um, we're going to need more uh, time series analysis methods, uh, more machine learning models that account for time series data, and so on. Um, certainly, these models do exist, um, but we may also need to see um, expansions of them as well. And what this really means is more collaboration. Right, more collaboration with data scientists, with statisticians, um, who can help us expand into some of these areas. Because you know, these methods do tend to require a lot more complexity and a lot of nuance um, that many of us may not be, you know, as used to handling. Okay, now sort of going forward into the future, um, as I've been alluding to, as I'm sure most of you are very well aware, um, we are absolutely at the precipice of something that's changing very, very quickly right now. So there's this sort of new landslide of tools to address uh, this research. So this is going to include things like, you know, headsets and expanded equipment with integrated integrated measurement tools in areas like eye tracking um, and body tracking, which I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with. Um, we're also seeing expansion into facial tracking, so tracking of the lower half of the face during VR use. A lot of physiology measurement. Um, so there's a wide range of measures here, including, you know, ECG, which has to do with sort of heart rate. 
um, EEG, brain activity, EDA, so that's um, electrodermal activity, that's uh, sort of the um, activation of, of sweat glands, basically, uh, pupillometry, and you know a bunch more. We're also seeing integration of some neuroimaging um, right into the headsets, which can relate to brain control interfaces, EEG, um, FNIRs as well, functional near-infrared spectroscopy is being integrated. Um, so there's a lot going on here. But what do these data acquisition tools really give us overall? Um, well, they give us data points that feed into an analytic pipeline, right? So these feed into most often complex machine learning and analytic models and the algorithms that go with us to automatically attempt to identify psychological constructs. And so there are a lot of psychological constructs that um, can go with these analytical models. And so things that um, have been talked about have to do with mental load and emotion, um, preference and attention, um, engagement, performance, confusion, fatigue. Uh, so a lot of psychological states that are really important, really, really exciting. So I'm, you know, I'm really looking forward to this, this future um, that is you know, sort of staring us in the face right now. Uh, I will just, as a caveat, you know, give a reminder that these two tools are going to require a little bit of due, due diligence on our part. So when we're looking to apply these tools, you know, we're going to have to be evaluating the data quality. You know, how good are the data coming out of these sensors? Um, we're going to have to assess how the analytics were validated. And importantly, in what context were the analytics validated? And are they um, you know, a good match for the context that we want to look at? So we've done some of this work in the past um, in our lab. And we found, for example, that sometimes analytics that are designed you know, really for a market research context, for example, don't necessarily work in the ways we might need them to work or want them to work for the rigorous kinds of research that we're wanting to do. So you know, th this doesn't, you know, this will make things a lot easier, but it still means there's going to be quite a bit of work um, that we'll need to do on our end. And then I'm just going to sort of wind up here uh, with a couple of slides, a little note about sort of the larger enterprise um, of covertly assessing psychological states for movement behavior in VR. So as a researcher in a medical environment, I am really, really excited about the potential and the possibility um, that behavioral tracing has for research and for medicine. Uh, VR provides such a wealth of information that really is right now unlike any other technology. Uh, but all the work that I've talked about so far um, and all the work that we have done has been conducted you know, within a framework of an IRB, right? So within a framework where we have ethics review, uh, where it's propped up by the you know, typical pillars of privacy and confidentiality, of explicit, very explicit, participant consent and review of the consent documents to make sure that you know people really will understand um, what's being collected and what's being done with that information and overall an assurance that you know the potential benefits of the data collection for science uh, for the individual um, you know for the purpose that it's being collected will truly outweigh the risk to the individual research participant um, and so that's you know sort of the context that i'm used to dealing with and that's the context with in which probably a lot of us you know, are used to thinking about uh, these data. Um, but outside of this framework, we face real problems and we face some threats to privacy and to security and to consent. Uh, so we've seen um, you know, the psychological, the behavioral, even the medical information that can be gleaned through collection and analysis of VR data. The part that I haven't really talked about is how personal these data can be. So, you know, research, um, as an example, some of the research I'm showing you here, um, has shown pretty convincingly that individuals can become identifiable based on the biometrics that are captured um, through VR use. So this study here by Mark Miller and colleagues shows that using head and hand movement, um, even with a, within a data set of 500 people, you know, they are able to identify individuals using their biometric data at about a 95% accuracy rate. So, you know, if VR data can contain information, you know, roughly about what you're thinking, what you're feeling, um, and information about who you are, you know, sort of how are we going about um, protecting, protecting these data? So right now, um, I would argue we're not doing a fabulous job of it. Um, in the consumer VR world, uh, use of VR data is not universally protected. Um, you know, some countries and, and places do better than others, um, but in many places, 
uh, it's really governed based on comp company policies and user agreements. So those agreements that we almost never read and we scroll to the bottom and we click here, right? And we agree to. So we're lacking um, overall, I think, in agreed upon standards for data collection, you know, what's fair game to collect, what's fair game to keep, for how long, uh, lacking in ways to ensure truly informed consent. Um, lacking in uh, privacy-friendly policies, and then you know potentially also in legislation uh, to protect VR users. So obviously this is a multifaceted and evolving area. Um, it's a whole other conversation and talk in and of itself, um, and it's actually not one where I'm a huge expert, um, where I lean on the expertise of my colleagues, um, but it is you know, part and parcel of these really exciting new developments in behavior tracking. Um, so, you know, it's important to think about it as the potential uh, flip side of the coin when we're thinking about all of the benefits uh, that these data can bring us. So I've included just a couple of resources at the bottom um, to get folks started if, if you're interested in learning more about that. So I'm going to actually wind up here because I want to make sure that I have um, you know, plenty of time to address questions and, and talk you know, a little bit deeper about some of these issues. Um, so I'm going to come back to sort of this promise of behavioral tracking in VR uh, for research, for medicine, for other public goods. Um, I have put up here on the slide a paper I wrote with Haley Uremich, a former student, that underlies a lot of what I've talked about today, um, although I've gone a little bit off course, and this goes deeper into some of the, the research uses um, of the behavioral data. Um, I've also put up my contact information, so please you know, feel free to reach out. Um, but as of now, you know, I'll just say that I'm happy to answer questions um, and, and discuss some of these topics a little bit more. Wow, Susan, thank you so much. Um, I'm even more excited now than the beginning. That was really a fantastic presentation. I, I, I'm sure I can speak for many uh, really learned a lot. Um, what you said and the way you kind of walked us through that so carefully. So thank you. Um, before turning the questions that Dan will moderate, um, your comment about uh, you know the ethics, I, I'm always fascinated by the ethics in, in VR, um, but in particular, uh, the 360 video. So just, just a very short anecdote before we move on. Um, one of the things that WorldViz has been really getting into is, is doing a lot of 360, and um, um, I, I won't really go into that now, but um, as a result, we have these little 360 cameras kind of all over um, the office now. And <laughs> I borrowed one um, to go on a sailing trip a couple of weeks ago. And um, while we're sailing, I was basically extending it with a selfie stick and sticking it, you know, in people's faces. And I knew that, yeah, my my mug was going to be on the on the South Pole of all these 360s. But what I didn't realize, and I mean it's obvious, um, when I went to go edit that there are all these side conversations happening on the sailboat or just dirt on the floor or, you know, um, that was all there. And there were actually some surprising things. I mean, not, nothing, you know, <laughs> radical, but, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, these sensors are just one of many that are starting to capture in ways that we just have no real, no real clue yet. So, all right. Well, fun, yeah. fun topic. So, all right, let me uh, invite Dan to come on and we have a number of questions um, from our audience that we'll go through. And then I will uh, like, uh, wrap us up. Dan? Dan's afraid of being uncensored now. <laughs> exactly. Sampled 60 times a second. <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, yeah, and thank you so much, Susan. This has been an awesome talk, and we've got a lot of questions. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen so I can show you all what's going on uh, in the attendee question and answer realm. So uh, I think we've got some awesome questions here. Uh, just give me one sec as I navigate my dashboard. Um, here we go. I'm going to make myself the presenter, show my screen. So go ahead. This is our second. So we've got two full pages of questions, Susan. So, uh, nice. the, yeah, uh, I think like we'll them. just start. Yeah, exactly. I think we're going to just go uh, first come, first serve order here. So uh, the first question we have is, uh, can the subjective sense of presence be considered as behavioral measure? Yeah, um, so there have been a lot of attempts, I think, to use <laughs> behavioral and physio physiological and other um, measures of presence. Um, 
And, you know, I think with some success, but I think that is in a lot of ways um, a goal that we are still working towards. Um, you know, there's a, <laughs> a paper by Mel Slater forever ago, I think I was in grad school, about how you can't measure presence with a questionnaire because it's not really very meaningful. And of course, we've all been measuring presence with questionnaires, you know, in the 25 years since then. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, figuring out physiological and behavioral indexes of presence would be, would be a really useful exercise. That's actually something we're working on right now um, in our lab. But, you know, as I said, probably 10 times during my presentation, um, it's going to be context specific because, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, enacting certain head movements in environment? Well, it depends on what's all around you. So, um, so yes, but I guess. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, this next question is a bit more specific about your research in particular. Um, in the study with parents and food choices, what made some parents take more twisted pathways in the buffet? Yeah, and so we think there are a lot of things that probably contributed to parents' paths. I mean, I think all behavioral measures are going to, none of them are going to be, you know, unitary constructs with a one-to-one -one match, right, to something. Um, mm -hmm. But when we were looking at the sort of psychological piece of it, uh, we made sure to factor in a lot of the other sort of practical reasons we think people walk around in a more curvy path. So, um, you know, one of the things we think is going to be really important is sort of how many foods did the parent choose, right? And, and how does the parent actually walk around the environment? So if, you know, one parent put three different foods on the plate and one put 11 different foods on the plate, you're going to see a more curvy path from the person who visited 11 trays. You know, so we try to control for things like that. Um, and really, uh, you know, the amount of time they spend, right? So if you have more time to spend, you are probably going to walk more in, in a more curvy path. Um, but what we found was that over and above all of those things, um, we really think that the parents that were kind of walking around in a more curvy way, that was indicative of them really trying to kind of look around and visit the different options, um, you know, and try to create a plate um, that, you know, was uh, what they saw as a healthy plate for their child. Uh, so we think it's this this indication in this context um, of effort um, in, uh, in putting together, you know, what ended up um, on that tray. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be taking some of the language that you use, <laughs> integrating it into my own thinking and talking about VR research. And so uh, the effort and, uh, you know, torturous paths and everything is uh, really awesome. So um, our, our next question is, uh, do you use uh, VR platforms for some studies to get remote participants? So they offered uh, all space, rec room, and gauge as different options. Yeah, so we have not done that. That is something that, um, as you can imagine, a lot of us have looked towards during the pandemic. Um, there were a bunch of efforts to try to figure out, you know, if we could you know, a lot of us in, in behavioral and social science use um, like Amazon MTurk to collect data. So we just sort of send mm. questions out and, and bring the data in. So there were a lot of questions. What well, could we get, you know, MTurk for VR, right? Could we somehow make it so that people with VR headsets could have a set of um, studies they could participate in and, um, you know, we could get the data back to us, you know, in the lab. Um, that there are a few um, aggregate places, and I can't remember the name, but there are, is at least one that you, know, you can go to and look at different VR studies that, that can be, you can participate in, um, you know, sort of as an option. The social VR um, applications is a really interesting idea, and it's one that we've been talking to some colleagues about, um, about sort of putting some of our, um, some of our study environments out into uh, into a more social VR context where we could, you know, sort of block it down maybe and, and just do our, um, you know, our more controlled research as opposed to putting something out in a true social VR um, kind of context. Uh, it's, not the, it's not something that we've actually done quite yet. We've tended to develop um, really for, uh, you know, tethered VR. Um, a lot of what we do tends to be pretty intensive and we really want all the data on the back end, which can be a little bit you know, of a of a tougher um, thing to get when you're thinking about you know sort of a social VR context. Uh, so, so no, it's not something we've done, but it is something that other people are starting to do, um, and it's something we certainly would look toward um, in the future. 
uh, to make some of this a little bit easier because right now we do tend to bring people all the way onto campus you know into a clinical center where they have to go through admissions and so on you know to get to us um, as sort of a middle ground we've done a little bit of um, taking our systems out so um, in some studies we've been interested in collecting data say from practicing physicians you know a practicing physician is probably not going to come across town to NIH you know come up to the lab uh, for data collection at least not for the amount that we were able to pay them um, so we have been taking our system out to you know a conference room at a medical center um, across town or even across the country uh, to collect data there so that's been sort of our middle ground but um, but I do think this is emerging and I think um, more and more folks will be uh, coming up with ways to collect data in these, um, you know, sort of these social VR spaces. Perfect. Yeah, I think we can we can speak to that too a little bit, but uh, I think we'll keep it on Susan for the for the time being. Um, so uh, the next question is: uh, Although big data is certainly a useful method of understanding huge amounts of data on a high level, what role does bottom-up approach, e.g., grounded theory, play in this? Bottom up, I mean, I think bottom up is 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 everything in some sense. I mean, even when you're thinking about your sort of big data, uh, we're working on some machine learning models, uh, you still decide what goes into the models, right? And so um, it's not like we're feeding a bunch of raw data in there. You know, we have to decide that, you know, hey, this um, scanning behavior that was in some of these papers that I talked about, um, you know, in the environment we're thinking about. So right now we're thinking about this with our, our virtual buffet environment. Um, you know, this scanning behavior, this looking around, um, that's probably really meaningful, you know, and what metric of that are we going to put into the model? Um, so what the movement in VR is likely to mean um, and what, you know, what connections we can make with previous literature and with theory are super important in figuring out, um, you know, even what to put into the, you know, the sort of the big data models. Um, so I think that's really, a very important starting point um and you know as a as a social psychologist i mean at the end of the day i i don't want a black box just saying you know this predicts that i want to understand mechanism and i want to understand how um and so i think uh we, we definitely start thinking about it that way uh when we when we think about some of these more complex modeling um approaches <clears throat> awesome yeah, and I think this next question um, was partially answered during your presentation, but they, they put it out there and others it would be good to maybe touch on it again. Um, could you speak more to why validation is currently elusive? Uh, they, yeah. they think it has something to do with the visual spectrum and potentially different hardware as well. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's true. Um, and so I think validation is elusive. I mean, I partly mentioned it is because we're all creating our own VR environments. Right. Um, right now, every research group is sort of starting from scratch, um, it seems like. And uh, what movement in a, a VR environment, you know, even like the four that we use, um, it means something very different in each of those four environments. And they all have different um, sort of characteristics and decisions that were made about like, where things are placed. Um, how do you navigate around the environment? Are you seated or standing? Um, you know, some, can you uh, teleport? I mean, that's going to change everything about what movement means if you're able to teleport instead of just sort of walking over to something. Um, you know, what's the input mechanism? You know, how close do you have to stand to something when you're making a selection? Um, all of that is going to change the characteristics of the behavior. And so unless you're really comparing apples to apples, you know, and not that many people want to run the same experiment a bunch of times in different ways to validate um, a behavioral measure. Uh, it, you know, it's going to be really hard to do. So we're starting to do it a little bit in our VR buffet, just because we use it so often. We've now run, I think, five studies with it, um, so we have a good good pool of data um, to work with, and we expect to use it in the future. But you know, when when a lot of these VR studies are one offs, um, you know, there's not a lot of incentive to validate things. Um, another issue, which I think might speak more to the question, is that every time you change a headset, you know, the technology changes, you're probably changing things like, you know, the visual angle at which you're looking at things, how large do things look in the environment. Um, we definitely ran into that with our VR buffet. Uh, we went from using uh, what we now call our legacy equipment, our um, Envis SX60s, uh, and we moved to using Vives, and the whole look of the environment was different. 
even though nothing changed on the back end, right? The food all suddenly looked a lot smaller. Um, so we had to go back and say, well, you know, what looked like, you know, a 50 calorie chicken nugget now looks more like a 30 calorie chicken nugget. And so what do we, you know, do we have to now go back and recalibrate all of our um, calorie information? Um, and, you know, we thought the answer was yes. So we had to go back and kind of figure out how are we going to calculate information just based on changing the headset. So, you know, I think um, all of these things play into um, play into the inability or the difficulty of, of validating these tools um, and sort of having that, you know, that be a, a valid um, way of measuring things going forward. Yeah, definitely. And uh, things are always changing too, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a, I think we have a few more questions and I think we might have enough time to answer them all. Um, we've got 10 more minutes left, so. Uh, uh, the first question on our second page is a lot of organizations with different ethical frameworks have been uh, bringing VR to the masses. Which ones, uh, VR and data tracking products, do you use and recommend? So I, of course, uh, never recommend anything on behalf of NIH. I am not mm -hmm. speaking on behalf of the federal government. Um, so I will just start there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have tended uh, Luckily, we do everything kind of in a closed garden. Um, mm -hmm. So we've tended to do everything within our own system, you know, and keep all our own data, work with our own environment. So, you know, although, you know, I think this is a, a big issue, this is not one uh, where we as a, as a research lab have had to deal with it very much because uh, we're not sort of um, out there in the broader VR ecosystem. So, uh, you know, luckily we haven't had to deal with that as much uh, for me to sort of have evaluated all of the different um, hardware and, 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 you know, software solutions and things um, to make those decisions. Um, I, you know, certainly acknowledge that there's been a lot of uh, conversations about, you know, some of these different um, hardware types and vendors and things like that. And I, I think that, you know, my colleagues um, at XRSI, which I put up on my last slide, you know, have definitely given these issues a whole lot of thought. Um, so I would definitely point you to some of the um, the folks who sort of think about this day in and day out. Um, you know, we've mostly been in a in a Vive ecosystem in our lab just because that's given us um, you know the good sort of uh, tethered VR experiences that that we've wanted, and you know the the early transition to eye tracking and things like that. Um, and we've certainly been now looking at some of these new. Um, these new headsets uh, that have more of the the sensors and the metrics sort of built into them. Um, you know, we've recently um, uh, gotten the HP Omnicept headset, which we've been you know impressed with, um, but haven't had an opportunity to try out a lot of the other ones. Um, that one just happens to have a lot of the features that we think are important for the kind of research that we do. So. There's my yeah. answer, not answer. <laughs> That's perfect. And you can pass on anything. So don't feel obligated just because we have a yeah. type test. So uh, yeah, we've we've definitely been working with the Omnicept as well at World Vision. I'm pretty excited about uh, the direction that that's going um, from HP, kind of a long title for the, <laughs> for the, yeah. the Omnicept G2, uh, the HP Parker. Reverb Omnicept G2 edition or something like that. So it's like, uh, yeah, I got it. Um, our, our next question is, is there a potential to use VR covert measures to make inferences regarding cognitive processes that give rise to individual decision making? I think there probably is. Um, I think it is going to depend depend on context. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a scientist answer. It, kind of, it depends. Um, but it depends on what kind of decision, you know, and sort of are there, um, you know, sort of elements in the environment that are contributing to this decision? You know, and we, I mean, in eye tracking, uh, researchers have been doing this forever, right? And they've been looking at what parts of the screen or, you know, the scene that somebody's looking at. Um, and those do pretty reliably, you know, relate to the eventual decision in a lot of instances. And, and you know, certainly VR is moving in that direction. So, you know, I think if we're thinking about, 
you know, a grocery store situation where there's actual products that people are, you know, deciding between looking at in front of them, you know, if it's a clinical situation where there's a medical record and you can see sort of where they're looking in the medical record or, you know, are they checking the genetic test results or, you know, if, if there's something visual that the person is doing, um, no brainer, yeah, you know, I think we're going to be able to use uh, some of that kind of behavior. Um, we're also, you know, going down the road of facial expression and facial tracking, you know, and I think that's another um, avenue that people have been really interested in, um, in terms of uh, how, you know, those visible um, markers of emotions and other things uh, play in uh, to these sort of uh, micro decision making processes. Uh, so I think there's a lot of promise for that, but if, you know, but if we're talking about a decision that's largely just sort of um, cognitive with without a lot of engagement with the environment then that might be a harder a harder thing to do Got it. yeah and i think in the interest of time we can still get these last two um is there any tool who uh that to assess social behavior measures and social cognition measures within one vr program any any tool that you could recommend or, or that you might speak to from personal experience yeah, I mean, I think the question of like tool, I mean, it, you know, it sort of depends on, um, there are now, you know, backend tools, there's software, analytics software. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different ones. I mean, I know WorldViz has one um, as well. And, um, you know, these, these backend um, analytics tools are built in different ways. I think it would sort of depend on, um, Social behavior and social cognition. I mean, I I think of those two things as very tightly uh, joined um, and and interwoven. So, um, you know, I I I do think it would be kind of context dependent, and I do think a lot of the tools that are arising are you know geared towards eye tracking, geared towards you know a lot of these sort of um, these sort of metrics. But I don't think. There have been a lot of sort of back end tools that have been specifically built to look at interpersonal behavior. Um, so I'm not actually aware of anything that is sort of built for that purpose. Um, although, you know, I'm not aware of everything out there. Awesome. Perfect. And then this, this last question, I think, is uh, really kind of tying into the last segment of your presentation. Um, and a great place to end this. Uh, given the privacy and security concerns, how important is it for researchers to also push for policies and legislations while beneficial behavior of tracing, uh, tracking research is being performed in parallel? In hopes that when the industry uses uh, findings from research, there's some form of legislation. Uh, and as a follow-up to that question, how can HCI researchers contribute to this effort? And uh, thank you for the great talk. <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so I think you know, it is one of my soapboxes. You know, every time we talk about all of the benefits and the promise that we have to talk about sort of the, the black mirror side of things. Um, you know, I think there's always the hope that the things that are developed in academia will be used for good. Um, but I think that's a problem everywhere. You know, that's a problem with all kinds of scientific um, development, um, no matter what area you're in. So I, you know, would say, you know, I think pushing as individual citizens is important you know and i think talking about the potential um downsides of some of the stuff we're developing is important um i think though that you know and i don't know this from experience but from what i've heard um you know industry isn't just sitting quietly waiting to um capitalize on what academia is developing you know, a lot of times when, um, you know, we come out, we say, hey, look, you know, we can uniquely identify somebody based on their body movement industry is like, duh, yeah, we, we know that, um, you know, and so I think that, um, you know, I'm not quite as concerned about the sort of dual use nature of what um, industry, or I'm sorry, what academia is developing, but I think making sure that everybody is aware of this um, and, you know, sort of helping to spread the word and, you um, you know, sort of help out with some of these broader efforts that our, our sort of non-academic colleagues are spearheading when we have the right expertise and the right um, way to contribute. I mean, it's something that I, you know, as a as a person <laughs> in society, think is important. Awesome. Well, okay. Susan, I, I think on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Andy. Yeah.
Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for all the great questions, um, everyone. I have one, one myself, and I'll just throw it at you and see, uh, see how you respond. I was a little bit, you know, not directly related. Just very generally. Um, what's the one thing about the human mind you wish you truly understood? Oh and, my God. <laughs> and VR could help with that. Oh, uh, how can we, yeah. Um... I would say, do we have free will? But I don't know if VR. Can do that. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm in genetics, so that's you know that's top of mind always for me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But well, in terms of, the, yeah, I mean, if someone can figure out how VR can help with that, um, I'm in. Let me know. Um, we'll yeah. be a replication site. <laughs> that's a great, great, great answer. Great way to end. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dan, for moderating the questions. And thank you so much, Susan, for, for giving us a great education here today. That was really wonderful. Great presentation. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Susan. All right. Thanks. See you all next time. Take care. Thanks, Dan.